The Word says the power of life and death is in the tongue. But we think we can just flop everything all week, come to church and say, Oh God, hallelujah, I just love you. And go right out flapping our lips. open your Bibles to St. John chapter uh, 15. I'm going to pick up where we left off last week. I want to just read one scripture, but I do believe, and I'm going to just jump right into this because I have quite a bit I want to say, and I don't want to miss what the Lord has here for us. We've worshipped the Lord. We've been blessed. But how many of you know the Word of God needs to be carried out in our lives? The Word is not relevant today in much of society. And really, that is a tragic sadness, I believe, in our lives. Because how many of you know it's the Word of God that makes the difference? And in that Word of God, the power and the anointing of God is carried. He said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my Word shall not pass away. And I think so often today, it's sadly enough, that we see so much misery in the world because... Many places want to do away with what the Word says and what it stands for. And I challenge you really before the Lord, even not to just with this family, but with our own families and our own life, to learn to stand on the Word. And learn that the Word has to have the preeminence in our life to be first. In fact, I've had people say, and Jesus is that Word, but I've had people say, well, Jesus is my co-pilot. Well, I want to tell you, Jesus better be your pilot. And you better be the co-pilot. Because how many of you know you get yourself, you have enough problem driving. Can you imagine flying your life? Can I get an amen? amen? But the real power and the real anointing is not about what Jesus is doing flying the plane. It's are we ready to do what we need to do to see the power of God move in our lives? And I say this because so often... We have a tendency to really rub shoulders so much with the world that we forget what we're here for. Amen. And the things that God has blessed us with. I said in the beginning of this service, basically, I don't know what kind of week you have, but how many of you know every week isn't going to always be full of joy and put a smile on your face and a step in your walk? <laughs> Sometimes there are things we walk through, but how many of you know you need to keep moving through them and not camp out there? And I say that because so often our world today is living, in fact, uh, to be very transparent with you, uh, I'm going to be getting into bearing fruit, and, and fruit is something that he didn't say to say to be fruity, he said to bear fruit. And can I tell you, half of our world is a little fruity today? I mean, they act like granola, flakes, fruits, and nuts. But how many of you know they also look at us with, if you will, literally, the power to answer their problems, but we can't because we don't even know what's going on in life. And we have rubbed shoulders so much in many times with the world, not intentionally, but we become like them. And how many of you would agree that sometimes it's hard to tell a Christian apart from a person that isn't a Christian. In fact, a lot of people are looking for people that are willing to say, I want my life to stand for Jesus. And that alone is my goal and what gets me up in the morning and puts me to bed at night. And so with that being said, I think the first thing we have to do, in fact, this Bible tells us, it first says that I command you to love in this passage. Then it also tells us that I no longer call you a servant but I call you a friend. Everybody say friend. friend. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm a friend of Jesus. We sing about it. We talk about it. But much like the fatherhood of, of God himself, we look at it in a way of many of our friendships. And how many of you know, in today's worldly friendship, people don't know what it really means to be a friend. How many of you know to be a friend means you like that person no matter what they've done? Well, let me try that over here. 
that was sort of an amen, but people weren't sure if they were supposed to amen, I think. But how many of you know, most of us equate the friendship with Jesus like we do the friendship of the world? Or maybe a person that has let us down. I'm sure everybody in here has been disappointed by a friend in one time or another. But how many of you know Jesus is one that loves you no matter where you're at? Amen. It's not because you deserve it, it's because he loves you. In fact, really, none of us can be good enough. And sometimes we haven't been the best friend we could be to somebody else. Let's put this shoe on the other foot. How many of you know that we don't always do what's perfectly right? We might try, but how many of you know all of us in this room have missed it at one time or another of speaking an encouraging word to someone that needed an encouraging word? So with that being said, he said, I call you a friend. But what I want to read to you this morning is this. It's found here in verse 16, and it says, You did not choose me, but I chose you. Everybody say, I must be important. Amen. Say that out loud. Amen. God said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. Amen. And I mean, you know, no offense, but when you take that on, when you take that power on, when you take that anointing on, how many of you know, you know you're not living by chance, you're not living by luck, you're not living by some thing that just comes into your atmosphere of your life, but you are living by divine purpose, hope, joy, and love that is the power and the anointing of God to get you through whatever you need to go through. Because you are chosen by God. He knew you before he was, you were in his, the mother's womb. He knew you before the worlds were even framed, Ephesians says, that he has made us accepted. Now let me talk about this chosen thing. Let me just reiterate. I talked last week that many times in our life we do crazy things to be accepted. All people want to be accepted. How many of you know, let's, let's just start with a couple of them. How many of you know that many of us dress to be accepted to the group we're in? Amen. Can I get an amen? amen? But how many of you know that we also do things like we say what people want to hear? to be accepted. I mean, we know somebody's... <laughs> yes, I'm going to say that. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know how your life works, but the Holy Spirit, I believe I'm under the Holy Spirit, and sometimes my mind can't keep up with what the Spirit's doing, because I, I don't really want to say things that's going to be offensive, but how many of us tell people they look better than they really do? <laughs> I had somebody come here when we did the night of, uh, of God's Not Dead. I mean, we had like 400 people here that night. It was amazing. You couldn't even get in this room. We had the platform gone. We had chairs clear up here. It was a blast. I mean, there wasn't two empty chairs in the entire room. And I had a girl that grew up in the church. And... When she was leaving, I was at the back, I was out in the foyer, and she came up to me and she said, do you remember me? And how many of you know the first thing I wanted to say was yes, when I didn't remember her at all? <laughs> because, you know, you want to be correct, you know, you want to be politically correct. You don't want to hurt, go, no, I don't remember you, who are you? <laughs> and the Holy Spirit dropped into my heart and said, tell the truth. And so I said, I'm sorry, honey, I really don't remember you. And you know what she said to me? She said, I grew up in this church as a child going to super church, and I'm now grown and married. You haven't changed a bit. <laughs> Should have remembered her. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm sorry I obeyed the spirit for with her. But no, I'm only kidding. But I mean, we all say things, not intentionally maybe, even out of a goodness of our heart, that we really don't mean. And I'm not saying to be mean to people, but church, when we allow things like that to start happening in our life, what else creeps in? Yeah, that's right. Come on, church, are you there? I mean, yeah. you know, it says that we're chosen. We want, we want to fit in so bad. Sometimes we do the wrong things. Maybe not even intentionally, but all of us want acceptance. I don't know a person in this room that can honestly say, 
I don't want to be accepted. I don't care. Because they're only lying to themselves. They're speaking probably out of some wound where someone has rejected them because they were transparent. But God is not like that with us. God loves us in our good times and our bad. When we're doing the best we can and when we're not doing so good. Because he didn't choose us because we're perfect. He chose us because he loves us. And out of that love, if you can become and know who you are, you will walk in this world completely different than the world does. But until you recognize it, you are so important to God that you're not here by the chance this morning. God knew before time began for humanity that you would be here this morning and you would need to hear something from me. And I really mean that from my heart. But when you know that, how many of you know, then the troubles and the sorrows of this world can't get you off course. That's right. But until you know that you're chosen by God and that God blesses you no matter how you feel, then I want to tell you, you can walk with a song in your heart and a step in your walk. But until you know who you are and that you are chosen by God, and more people need to hear that, because I think most of the anger and unforgiveness and the things that happen in this world are done by people that don't know who they are. They're ran by their feelings. They go by everyday motions. And God is telling us that we need to live by the Spirit and not by the flesh. And we need to recognize who we are in the spirit realm. And when we do, it will affect the flesh life that we live. But until we do that, we, we connect again with our history, our makeup, our personality, and all of those things. God loved you no matter what they were, but he loved you the best because he desired for you to change and to know who you are. And by knowing who you are, you can help others that don't know who they are. The word says that if two are blind, they both fall in the ditch. But I'm here to tell you, you're special to God this morning. The anointing of God is on you. Quit trying to be somebody else. Quit trying to live out a copy when you're an original. And God desires for that originality to come out of you. Number two, he goes on, and this is really where I want to pick up. He talks about, he says, and you need to go and bear fruit. Everybody say go. Now the first thing we think about is how many of you know you need to learn to share your faith? In the world in which we live, we live in a very hostile world again to the Bible. Into Christianity even. Because most people openly, and I love them, but, but openly most people want to be God themselves. They don't want a God over them. And if they can be God themselves, then they can do whatever they want, and if you will, and they can justify it just by being themselves. And many people say things like, well, it doesn't hurt anybody whatever I do. How many of you know that's a lie from the pit of hell? How many of you have had kids that have been away from the Bible, away from the Lord? Or how many of you have had your younger children disappoint you? Well, then, even as a child, whatever we do affects other people. And even more so as an adult. How many of you know that someday, and many of you are young setting in here, how many of you know that someday, in fact, it's true, my mother-in-law told me years ago, she said, your children, when they're young, they step on your toes. But when they get older, they step on your heart. Amen. Because how many of you know, they might be grown and they might even be adults. But you still care about what happens in their lives. God. And that never stops. So the lie that you can do whatever you want and it doesn't affect anybody is a lie right from the pit of hell. It's not from God. God said we're to go. We're to know why we believe what we believe. We're to be able to share the gospel with the world. The first thing that comes to the word go is found in Matthew 28 when he says, Go ye therefore into all the world, teaching them the things I have taught you. How many of you know we've got to be taught? In fact, in Wednesday nights, in a few uh, weeks, in the middle of September, we're going to begin a class to where we're going to deal with four or five of the everyday questions that are asked to Christians by non-Christians. Things like, well, how do you believe in an invisible God? How do you know that he's there? 
things like, well, if, if God is such a good God, why do bad things happen to good people? Why is there so much suffering in the world? Well, I mean, that's pretty simple, but it's true. How many of you know there's a free will in life? We choose to live how we want to live. But see, it's a non-responsibility kind of thing. And even though you have answers, most people can't answer why they believe the Bible. Why do you believe the Bible's true? I mean, it was written by all these different people, different time spans. I'm going to even know you need to be able to answer that. So we're going to teach you, we're going to kind of have an interaction class where we can teach you five to seven of the toughest questions that are things like, and I'm going to say this, I know it's going out on camera, but things like, and I told them, I want them to deal with this. Why do you not like abortion, a woman's right to choose, and why do you not like gays? And it isn't about like. It's I believe life is sanctity to God. That if he knew you before you were in your mother's womb, then in my opinion, the word has to set the course. Now, it doesn't mean everybody's going to agree. And as far as not loving the homosexual, I love the homosexual, but I believe it's a sin. I'm sorry, I don't think God made that. I think that's a choice. And I know I have a lot of young people in here, and I know school will tell you different. But church, you need to learn how to answer the hard questions. Not just the easy ones. Or why are you saved by Jesus? Why do you have to be saved? Why do you have to go to church? Well, you don't have to go to church. Church doesn't make you a Christian any more than driving through McDonald's makes you a Big Mac. <laughs> but the word does say, don't forsake the assembling together of yourselves even more so as you see the days approaching. So there are Bible answers, but many people are afraid to share their faith because of the questions that come up. So we want to assist you, we want to help you, and we want to develop you that you may go into the workplace, into the highways, into the byways, and share with people when questions come up. But how many of you know, and let me get to this because this is the main part of my message. How many of you know he says to go, but he also says to bear fruit? How many of you know to bear fruit is more powerful than even the going part? Amen. Because how many of you know you might read this Bible, but most of the world reads your Bible? Amen. The way you live, the way I live. What kind of fruit am I sharing? What kind of fruit do people see in my life when they look at my life? If I'm to go and bear fruit, it's not just about sharing my faith. It's also living a godly life. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Somebody said amen. amen. Now, let me talk about that for a minute. There's just two things, and, and I, I'm, this isn't my main sermon, but I, I got to say this. I said it in the first service. How many of you know there are two things that I see happening in life? I, I've got to be speaking over the next couple of weeks uh, at some other places. One church I don't know anything about. I've never been there. And I've been really praying about what does the Lord want me to give those people? Because I believe you have to deposit something into people's lives. If I'm going somewhere to speak, I don't just want to go there and give another sermon. I want to minister to who's in the room. And so I've been really praying about that, and I've been talking to the Lord and really asking God, not knowing the church. I know the pastor very well, but I don't know the people of the church at all. But I believe I'm going there on a divine mission. Amen. And I don't say that lightly. I take it very serious. But I'm going to deposit some fruit there. But when I speak, when I've, I've spoken all over the world now, when I, when I speak and I talk about things like unforgiveness and I pray for people or anger, 80% of the room stands up. We're living in an angry world, church. And the church world is angry. People can't do the most simplest thing like forgive. How many of you know you can talk to somebody that's hurt you? Amen. That's right. How many of you know you can get over the past? Amen. But you have to allow the Spirit of God to penetrate your heart and renew your mind to really love and forgive. And he said, the greater commandment has no man that will lay down his life for his other. How many of you know that's painful? Nobody likes to be rejected. Nobody likes to be hurt. But how many of you know we have the power to forgive? The world does not. 
because they try to do it in their own intellect when we say it's not by might nor by power but it is by the spirit saith the Lord how many of you know we are spiritual beings we are not just earthly beings but we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us and that Spirit is big enough to help us get over whatever comes our way. And whatever happens to us, maybe we've been let down, maybe we've been hurt, but the only way I believe you can ever forgive is to change the other thing that I see the most common. People never control their tongue. I said people never control their tongue. I mean, we are in a country that thinks we're free to say whatever we want. Everybody say, I love pastor. I love pastor. <laughs> but I am going to say this to you. If you have been saved two to five years, you shouldn't be using the F word. Amen. Amen. In fact, you shouldn't be cussing at all. Amen. We need to renew our mind. We need to take responsibility of what we say. The word says the power of life and death is in the tongue. But we think we can just flop everything all week, come to church and say, oh God, hallelujah, I just love you. And go right out flapping our lips. Wah, wah, wah. I mean, <laughs> are you out there? I said you love pastor. But it's the truth. We think we can say whatever we want when it says out of the abundance of the heart the mouth will speak the reason God said that is because he doesn't want those kind of things in our heart and just like I was saying about telling a little lie pretty soon it won't matter if it's a big lie well if we give little things out of our mouth and things that don't glorify God how many of you know eventually you're gonna be saying all kinds of things out of your mouth but what we want is we say, I remember, I remember years ago, because I really believe in confession. I really believe that confession is such a big part of our life, and very few people preach on it, and it breaks my heart. But I remember, we used to have a girl named Lucy in the church. She played the saxophone. It was awesome. Her and her husband came in, dedicated their life, and, and some of you might remember, it's been years ago that she was here, but I got on this kick. This was 20-some years ago, and I got on this kick where I said, I gave everybody, I had court jar set up in the back and I gave everybody a court jar and and whenever they said anything bad during the week they had to put a quarter in and then they had to bring it to the church and we were going to give it to missions and probably about the third week into it Lucy brings her jar in and there's a five dollar bill in there <laughs> And I'm, I mean, she could tell by the look on my face, I, like when she brought her jar in and put it, I went, oh my word. And she said, I got so mad at Freddie, I just took a five out, put it in there, and then I could say whatever I wanted. <laughs> How many of you know I said to Lucy, I said, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> But next time it's going to be five dollars per time with you. Um, but it, you know that's life. I mean, we all blow it. But the thing is, learn to control your words. There are things Pastor Sandy and I have done. How many of you know marriage is the toughest at this? I think because how many of you know we get comfortable with our maid and and we learn to be ourselves and we can say whatever we want. But how many of you know there are words that you need to cut out of your vocabulary if you're married? Words like divorce. Yes. Amen. Sandy and I made a covenant over 30 years ago that we would never, no matter how angry we get, we would never use those words. That word. There are certain words I've cut out of my vocabulary that I have promised to the Lord that I will not say. Because I know it does not edify anything. Words like, it will never change. That's not true. If it's one thing I'm sure of of life, it will change. And people can change. But one of the reasons why we have such a hard time with forgiveness 
and not bearing the fruit we need to bear is because we don't control what we say. I know you're hearing this, but hear me, church. I love you enough to tell you the truth. You can never change the atmosphere you live until you change the way you talk. And when you change the way you talk, do you believe you're created in the image of God? Amen. The word said that let us make them in our image and in our likeness, let us make them. Well, how did God create? With words. He said, and it was, he said divide the sea from the land, the stars in the sky. The only thing he touched by his hand was you and I. But when he created everything else, he did it by creating the atmosphere, the water, the land, by speech. And if you are made in the image of him, how many of you know your speech has power? That's right. Amen. I mean, it's that simple. Plus, you speak out of your heart. God cares what's in our heart. Because that's more important than what's in our head. So with the power of life and death in the tongue and in that anointing, how many of you know the world is looking at the words we say? Because they can't control what they say. I don't know about you, but it hurts my feelings when people use... I mean, growing, I was in the military for four years, and I never even used the F word, even when I wasn't saved. And now people use that like nothing. And it breaks my heart. And many of them, they use that word one day and the next day they're saying, I love the Lord with all my heart. God touched me. God said, let a double-minded man think he cannot receive anything. Just what James says. Yeah. That he's like the sea tossed to and fro with every wind that comes by. How many of you know God is looking for people that are consistent? Fruit that is bearing, that's worth eating. Fruit that is... I know it's quiet in here, but I know you're receiving this. And even you all out there on the TV, I want to tell you, if we don't change the way we talk, we don't bear the fruit God desires for us to be in this world. And he said, go and bear fruit that lasts for eternity. How do we do that? The only thing we can do is talk and recognize we're working in eternity right now. What you're speaking right now will change your family, your life, on your job. It will change things in the future. So I don't know what you want to eat in a year from now or three months from now, but you're sowing fruit seeds right now by the words you say. Amen. Hello? Amen. How many of you know you've got to speak over your kid in a positive way? You can't say, you're never going to amount to nothing. Hello? Because how many of you know you're sowing something into their life? You can't say over your mate, you'll never change. I didn't even get one amen on that. <laughs> but church, our words have that power, and I know that this is very challenging to our life, but listen to me, church. I love you enough that that fruit is going to remain whether you think it will or not. Because whether you so good or bad, it's going to make fruit bear in somebody that is close to you. And even in your own life. And now that's the fruit you're going to eat. I don't know about you, but how many of you know that that's really the blessing of God? And then let me close with this. Are you still out there? Amen. The Word also says... And then you can ask what you will and it shall be done for you. How many of you know most people want to get to that part of the scripture without the other part? Are you here? I mean, many of us want to ask God when we've been complaining all week. Hallelujah. So it even goes on through the power of that. And I'm only telling you this because I love you enough that if you don't set parameters, how many of you know the enemy will have a field day with your life and your heart and your mind? Right. That you have to choose. You have to decide. You have to let God be God. But when you do, then you can ask what you need. 
what the needs of your life is, when you care enough around you that you desire to change your unforgiveness, your words, your destiny, your purpose. And let me leave you with this. What things happen when we do that to create good fruit, then we walk in hope. And our world is living hopeless today. I've never seen the anger in the world that we've lived like I see now. And listen to me, even politically, people cannot disagree with respect. If anyone disagrees, it's hate. That cannot be so and have a rational society. So we can't play a part in that. Do I agree with much of what's happening with politicians? No, but I cannot hate them. Because there's no place for hate in me because Jesus is in there and there's no place for hate in him.